Hi, everyone. Just a quick warning before we get into the episode. We referenced the Sun newspaper, which is a UK tabloid, quote unquote, jokingly as journalism. And I just I know they've done a lot of really awful things in the past. So we just wanted to acknowledge that ahead of time. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast. I'm Abby Branker. I'm here with Alan Kudan. Hello. And today we are talking about crying boys. I, I was waiting for you to introduce yourself as Orby Bonkers. Oh, Orby Bonkers, yes. And your your Jollyville name is Erwin Kablam. Yes, indeed. So, yeah, our friends over at Jollyville Radio did a spoof, a parody, a, I don't know, recently a reenactment of... Yes, a, a reenactment. <laughs> of... Of Lunatics Radio Hour on their episode called Spam, and it's it had us laughing very hard. So please go check it out well, and listen well, to Jollyville. Well, I, I don't remember which celebrity said it, but it has been said that you know you've made it when someone in parodies your work. Mm, it's true. I mean, it's an honor, and it was so funny to to hear their takes on our personalities. It was right. It was spot on. So go go get a listen. So today we are here to talk about crying boys. Nothing is more terrifying (laughs) than a man showing his emotions. (laughs) No, that's not true. That we want more of that. We love that. We love when boys go to therapy. Mm. Everybody's vulnerable. Everybody should cry. I can't be the only one crying all the time, you know. (laughs) Despite your best efforts. (laughs) (laughs) So I was actually introduced to this urban legend by my favorite uh, email newsletter, Spooky Bitches. Spooky Bitches. That's right. Was this the same uh, issue where they celebrated large birds? No, that was different, but I know that one was important to you. What a title. What a title. Yeah, so we spooky love Spooky Bitches. bitches. Celebrating large birds. <laughs> they're awesome. They're really fun newsletters. They're always spooky and weird, and they have awesome... They're both writers, so they're well-written, and they have cool personalities, and they cover cool topics, so... I can't remember which issue you sent to me, but it was something that had like funny, sensational title like Celebrating Large Birds, but it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. But I ended up reading the article just because it got me. Yeah. And it's really, really well written. Yeah. Like it's it's actually like a really interesting newsletter despite the, the silly names. Yeah, for sure. No, they're awesome. And, you know, I think they also poke fun at themselves and they poke fun at pop culture and these weird trends and things that come up so Mm -hmm. i enjoy them i i I feel like they're doing it right where you just like you rope them in Uh uh-huh rope them in with the weird title and then once you got them journalism that's right yeah today's sources we have an article by dr david clark called the curse of the crying boy and this is really great research and he's done a lot to to not just like aggregate the history but also contextualize it so i'm pulling a lot from his article and we'll also link that below of course, the Spooky Bitches newsletter, first-hand account of cursed paintings from YouTube, Wikipedia, and Atlas Obscura. The belief in cursed objects could be a podcast all on its own. Even when you focus only on haunted or cursed paintings, the folklore and accounts could fill a book. For example, did you know that some believe a painting falling off of your wall is an omen of impending death, especially apparently if it's a portrait? Is it a painting of the person say you have a painting of yourself on the wall because That's you're a vain. crazy narcissist. You beat me to it. <laughs> um, and that falls off. Uh-huh. Right. Does that mean like your estate is doomed? I or, would hope so. Or if you just have a painting of your great, great, great grand dog, grand dog. Yeah. And that falls off. <laughs> uh huh. Does, is that impending doom? Even For the dog? Well, I mean, no, it's a great, grand, he, he's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're moving. Your brain is moving so fast. Keep up, kid. <laughs> so, um, but is it impending doom for the person in the portrait or just the household in which the painting falls? It's a great question. I originally interpreted it as for the household because I, in my personal belief, I don't think a lot of people have portraits of themselves unless you're super millionaires. And in that case, like whatever. But we might not want to poke fun at people that have portraits of themselves in their home because they're really rich and we would love them to donate to this podcast. (laughs) It's a great point. It's a good point. Please. If you're a millionaire, 
or a billionaire. We we don't discri- if you're discriminate. You're a millionaire or up. <laughs> get in touch. You know what? If you're join a, our Patreon. <laughs> if you're a thousandaire or up, we'll, we'll take your money. <laughs> That's very true. Today we're here to talk about a very specific belief in a very specific cursed object. Something with a painting. Yes. Okay. Today we are talking about the crying boys paintings. If you aren't familiar, I'd classify this as an urban legend that has a modest cult following. Crying boys are a type of painting which depict, as you might have guessed, the image of a crying child. I I, I know about this. This is like the boys look like Americana type. I'm thinking, uh, not Frank Lloyd Wright. Who's the guy <laughs> that like the Frank Lloyd Wright? Not Frank Lloyd Wright. The 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 guy that painted. Like the, the Norman Rockwell. That's the guy, Norman Rockwell. I mean, like a bunch of like kids. There, let, let's let me style. describe it so that we can all visualize it together. But I don't am, know am, that I would say Norman Rockwell. Am I this. close? This sounds familiar. I think you're thinking of the right thing. I don't think Norman Rockwell is the key to success to describe it. Norman Rockwell was the first crying boy. <laughs> he was the first boy that ever cried. No, no, that was Jesus. We're going to get a lot of hate mail from this episode. No, the first crying boy was Hitler when he got rejected from art school. Okay. Well, listen, I'm going to forward all the emails that come in right to you, okay? (laughs) Let's picture what this is together. I mean, you can look it up and we'll post photos of it. But crying boy, it's a pretty close up image of the the boy. So you see like his face and like his shoulders. And he's crying. And he's crying. And there's (laughs) tears. Typical victim complex. Tears painted. Of the white patriarchy. (laughs) Exactly. Some people suggest that the boy has an orange hue to him as if he is looking at something that's burning. The legend is that the paintings are cursed. They cause house fires, leaving everything eviscerated with the exception of the painting itself, which remains in perfect condition amongst the ashy remnants. Eviscerated? Yeah. What, you going to pick apart? Are you going to nitpick my word choice? Yeah. It, okay, it burns down the house, okay? Is that good enough for you? Oh, ev- evisceration okay. would be to, like, tear to shreds, Uh huh. right? If a, a bear got a hold of, like, a torso, it would eviscerate it. All right, Googling eviscerate. Okay, to disembowel a person <laughs> or an animal. All right, to deprive something of its essential content. Or to remove the contents of a body organ. Okay, so if a house is eviscerated, it would mean gutted, but the structure is intact. The goat has been skinned and nearly eviscerated. By the bear, yeah. Myriad little concessions that would eviscerate the project. So see, it can be abstract. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know how fires work, but I imagine it does kind of gut things out to some degree, right? Sure, if like everything was completely removed to ashes... I think that would fall under... It, it disemboweled the house. To, but that would indicate that the innards were removed elsewhere, not completely destroyed. I always thought that eviscerate was... Maybe I'm thinking of like evaporate but in my mind, but that's kind of always how I... Now I know. Listen. I think you're confusing evaporate and immolate. What's emulate? So immolate means... You think I wasn't an English major. <laughs> immolate means to burn something... And completely turn it to smoke. Okay. Well, that's the word I should have used. The legend is that the paintings are cursed. They cause house fires, leaving everything emulated. (laughs) (laughs) What's the word? Emulate means to recreate a facsimile of. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on from this. All right, so you guys get the idea, right? The paintings, the, the it's, well, here we go. Long story short, the paintings are believed to cause the fires because they're cursed, right? So they putting a painting in your house, you'll have a fire that everything will burn and that the painting will remain untouched. Okay, that's the curse. Another thing that happens is that some accounts claim that the minute the paintings were brought into homes, strange things started to happen. A quick point of clarity. Yeah. What year are we in? These paintings are, we're going to get into the specifics of all this, but the paintings were sold and created between the 50s and 70s. The curse and the urban legend stuff starts in the 80s, 1980s. Okay, because originally I'm picturing 
well, based off the painting, Norman Rockwell. But right. as soon as we talk about paintings and houses, I picture like Victorian era. No, no. More modern. Much okay. more modern. This is where in the country? This is in the UK. Oh, okay. The other, the other country. The, the other country. Yeah. So again, some accounts claim that the minute paintings were brought into homes, strange things started to happen. Doors closing on their own, hushed voices, increased accidents. That's a theme a lot where people started to get hurt more once the painting came in. It sort of builds and crescendos into the fiery aftermath, right? Mm. I'm thinking of that like one episode of Ghost Hunters that your family and I all watched together. Uh-huh. They said that they had a painting that was cursed and causing accidents, but the painting was hung right by a staircase and it was like in a weird spot and the stairs were like super weirdly shaped stairs. And so people just kept looking at the painting and not paying attention to the stairs and falling down the stairs. The thing I like about Ghost Hunters is that they'll debunk that. They'll call it out. They won't let it stand. That's why we like them. And they also like, these stairs are really weird. Like, who built these? <laughs> what's the what's that house, the Winchester Mystery House, where there's like doorways and things that lead nowhere? What? Yeah. Never heard of this one. you never heard of the Winchester Mystery House? You think I have? I don't know. It's pretty well known. It's like an attraction, you know, like a tourist attraction. Where, where is it? The Winchester Mystery House is in San Jose, California. Where's that? You don't know where San Jose is? I actually don't. It's right outside of San Francisco. Got it. The Crying Boy refers to a specific series of paintings that were mass-produced by Italian painter Giovanni Bragolin, which was the pen name of Bruno Armarillo. And we're going to get into him more at the end, so put a pin in this for now, because there's a lot of mystery around the painter himself, which we will address later. Amarillo or Amarillo? Amarillo. Yes, forgive all of my pronunciations. The series of paintings is called The Weeping Children, and the most famous of that is The Crying Boy. There are varying reports, as there often are with urban legends, around the production and release of these paintings. It's mostly believed that there was an original set made by the painter, and when I've been researching, I've seen there's been 27 originals, in some cases 67, like different versions of these crying children. Got it. And then they were later mass produced, but this one image of the boy is the one that's the most popular. Got it. They were marketed to young couples, which is in itself truly a bizarre legend. Why? I don't know. What, why do you find the marketing to young couples odd? Because we just went through a wedding registry for someone, mm -hmm. and there were some odd choices. What do you think was odd in that wedding registry? Like the fucking spotlight. It was a net. It was a security system. I don't think that anything about that registry was weird. I thought that was very normal. Okay, you're a young couple, right? You and I. We're a young couple. Not anymore. We're. Excuse me. Don't even start with me. You are a young couple, and <laughs> we're going shopping for art. You know, we are. I'm just saying, get just get get into the game. Okay, you're be imaginative with me for a minute. We're going shopping for art. You're like, hey, I have no art on my walls, which is true. So Send yourself up for disaster. But go, go ahead. And do you think we're we're we go to the art store and we're called to the painting of the crying child? Like, in what world are people like, oh my god, this sad child? I want to put this. If it's not a museum. Why are people bringing sad children paintings into their home, first of all? Like, what kind of omen is that? Okay, first Where off... Where are the happy children? And even children paintings at all is a very bizarre thing. No, they, they have absolutely nailed this market. If someone is going to the art store, <laughs> then, yeah, they can sell them fucking whatever to put on their wall. So they Well, should... these are mass-produced and sold in department stores. So this is not like you're going to a gallery. This is like you're at Filene's or JCPenney yep. or freaking whatever macy's and you go to the art section at the checkout right mm -hmm. and there's a hundred of these on the wall so you you knock that type of art sale no i'm not knocking it at all i'm not knocking that i'm saying For, however i'm not i just want to come clean i'm not <laughs> okay because it sounded a little bit like you were. I'm knocking uh, the, the on, crying excuse child. Me, excuse me. The, the choice to buy may, the crying child may i please I'm not knocking, finish but i've bought art at a target okay go ahead for, first off, I, I'm, I don't think there's any reason to start knocking the type of art that is marketed in these establishments because that is the number one place where a lot of artists make their money. And even very large established artists 
make the majority of their income through their prints on mugs and pillows and posters and all sorts of stuff. Because, yeah, it's great if you can sell a $100,000 painting, but think how much more you're going to make when it's you get royalties on every single little mug that gets printed at Ikea. If you're interested in some art of your own, you can head to lunaticsproject.com and click on merch. <laughs> that, that's right. Listen, I'm not above it. Obviously, I'm not above it. But I, I don't take issue with the filings sale of art. I take issue with... What what about young couples are like, I want a sad kid on my wall? My father, in the very early part of his relationship with my mother, they got this sad crying clown statue no. that he loves to death. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Maybe it's a generational thing then. Maybe in the 70s, it made sense. To me, in 2021, I can't wrap my head around it. Well, but you know what? I guess we'll call a spade a spade. Okay, we're getting off track here. You're you're trying to tell me why the hell these okay. things are haunted. Yeah. Are we all clear on the, the, the urban legend? Uh, no, not at all. So, uh, well, let me recap. Yes, please do. People bought these paintings that were mass produced, so they are literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's many accounts of once they bring the paintings back into their home, strange things happen, including their house burning down. We're going to get into the accounts now, but I wanted to set the stage. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to fairly recent history because our story really starts in 1985. Oh. On September 4th, The Sun, which is an incredibly popular UK-based tabloid, published an article titled Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy. Oh. The article tells the story of a fire that broke out in the home of Ron and May Hall in Rotherham in South Yorkshire. The downstairs of the house was very, very badly burned and damaged. However, the family had a framed painting on a wall, a crying boy, which for some unexplained reason was totally undamaged, though it was surrounded by the charred destruction that had overrun the rest of the room. Ron Hall's brother happened to be a firefighter, which is very important to the rising popularity of this legend. Because he added the bit of professional clout saying that this painting should have been uh, emulated. Yeah, so we're going to get into exactly the role that the firehouse... Oh, I see what you're doing. I see what you're making fun of me. Okay. The talk of the firehouse after the incident was that there have been multiple cases similar to this one. The firefighters had even created a rule banning anyone at the firehouse from buying one of the paintings. Hmm. So essentially, right, this happens. Ron and May Hall have a fire. The The crying boy survives. Mm-hmm. The thing, though, is that the sun decides, the new saber decides to cover this specific incident. Okay. Just so happens that this guy's brother is a firefighter who, uh, who in this firehouse has a lot to say, which we're going to talk about, a lot to say about this, which adds all this credibility in the newspaper article to what's happening. Got it. Okay. One of the firefighters claimed to have responded to over 50 cases of crying boys in the UK dating back to 1973. That's a lot. Yes. Though this firefighter was also adamant, and this was like the chief, I believe, adamant that he did not believe anything supernatural was involved. So he admitted that, yes, I've been to 50 cases where this has happened. I don't, though, believe that it's supernatural. Yeah, I, I guess it's like how many out of how many fires total. You know, if it's like 50 out of like a thousand, that's a lot. If it's 50 out of a million. I mean, I, I still think it's a lot. 50 fires that have an association with a painting, a specific painting is a lot, no? So in the same interview with this with this fire chief, yes. his wife is also interviewed. And she releases a statement saying that she <laughs> believes the tears from the crying boys is what puts out the fires. So what the Sun tabloid newspaper did mm -hmm. was ran her statement with the credibility of her husband as the fire chief, right? So they said, you know... They said, like, wife of fire, you know, whatever. Oh, she probably got an earful that night. <laughs> and so it started to shape the claim, right, of this into, like, an actual urban legend. That's pretty cool. The article from 1985 did some digging around the origin of these paintings and found that around 50,000 prints of the Crying Boys paintings had been sold across North England in various department stores. 50,000? 50, 50,000. Okay, that's actually less than expected. You think so? Yeah. 
Okay. I still think it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot, but I was expecting it to sell like millions. Got it. And then it comes down to 50 fires. Well, the thing is, this is in 1985, and this is all in the UK. As we get into the 90s, there's reports of these starting to, and I don't know if there's new copies or just that these copies are being, uh, they're appearing in other parts of the world. Okay. The article also noted that they were all signed by G. Bragolin. The credibility of the firefighters who claimed to have seen many instances of this case, combined with the power of the sun, one of the most popular tabloids of all time, skyrocketed the popularity and belief in the curse of crying boys. Sorry, it just sounds like, combined with the power of the sun. (laughs) On September 5th, 1985, the sun ran a follow-up story on the incident. The article revealed that the paper had been flooded with calls from people who claimed to have cursed child paintings at home. Some were terrified that their lives were cursed. Others had written in with their own experiences of tragedy that they attributed to the crying boy. One example, Sandra Cask wrote in from North Yorkshire. She claimed that both her sister-in-law and a friend had experienced devastating fires after they hung copies of the crying boy on their wall. Another call came in from Brian Parks, who said that a terrible fire sent his wife and three kids to the hospital from smoke inhalation. Once he got home, he destroyed the painting after he found it undamaged. But not everyone who contacted the newspaper had the same story. Others described accidents, injuries, hauntings, and even deaths that they attributed to the introduction of the painting into their home. Kids getting hurt, husbands passing away, objects moving. Some people even claimed that worms appeared in the wall behind the painting after they hung it. That's gross. Very gross. One of the people who contacted the newspaper claimed to have tried to burn two of the paintings, but discovered they would not burn, not even like darken, like they couldn't even char them. And I have a quote from them. It was frightening. The fire wouldn't even touch it, he told the son. I really believed it was jinxed. We really feel doubly at risk with two of these in the house. We're determined to get rid of them. I think I figured out what's going on here. You have a theory? I, I, I've, i what, what do they say? I've solved the mystery. Scooby-Doo? Yes. Okay, well, at the end, I would love to hear your theory. Okay, I'll write it down just so you don't... Write it down, me. put it in an envelope, seal it up, and mail it to me. We'll reveal it live on the air. But no, we'll, we'll just we'll just come back to it in a second. Okay. Because I have a theory too. One account I found on YouTube tells the firsthand story of a young girl in Lisbon, Portugal, who lived with her father. Her mother had passed away, and so they only had each other. One day, the girl was walking down the street, and she saw the painting in a shop at an art store, presumably, and was completely drawn to it. And her father agreed there was something almost supernatural about it why it just it had the mem it had a mesmerizing effect on them okay do you want to look it up so you can see sure what's it called crying boy there's like a thousand did you write painting after it no or is it just sad children i mean this crying boy painting these are really creepy i agree and so as a young couple do you now understand why it would be weird to put one on your wall Uh, this was not what i was picturing This doesn't look like Norman Rockwell at all. No. This looks like Rembrandt painted a sad child. Yes, that's a better description. Yeah, I mean, everybody look it up if you're not driving. Like, look it up because I I think it's important to have the visual. Yeah, it's pretty... I I would not want this staring at me in my home. Yeah, a lot of, obviously, the accounts are like that. The eyes fall, you know, typical what you would expect. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, burn it all. (laughs) So the father surprised the daughter with the painting for her birthday. She loved it and would spend hours looking at it, trying to figure out the boy and what his origin story is. Then they started to notice strange things after they brought it home. Murmurs, whispers, door slamming, weird accidents around the apartment. One day, when the father was getting groceries, a fire started in the apartment. The little girl was drying in the living room and saw smoke and flames coming from the other room. The girl started to panic as the fire surrounded her. She was, of course, obviously terrified. And just as she heard the sirens coming down the street, her father burst into the apartment and rescued her. They were both badly burned and lost everything except the painting. Oh, good. So this is a firsthand account. So not everything. (laughs) Yeah. But they lost their whole life. Like that's, you know, that's really shitty. On Halloween 1985 the son decides to make their big splashy conclusion to the crying boy series in their paper. (laughs) Splashy. (laughs) 
They got a hot. Was that your own word? Yeah. Okay. Why? I I was just curious. You think I should change it? No, I think it's great. I've just never heard you use the word splashy before. Well, all right. I don't talk about tabloids much, but I usually think they're pretty splashy. Mm, Sure, yeah. So they got a hot babe, Sandra Jane Moore, to pose as she burned a van load of crying boy paintings. The headline read, Sun Nails Curse of the Weeping Boys for Good. So the Sun had organized mass bonfires and burnings, encouraging people to burn their copies of the curse painting to rid the world of this terror. Okay. Many people sent their paintings into the Sun to be burned. And so that's what this mass fire was. For a while, things simmered a bit with the urban legend, right? Until things start to get really meta. In March of 1986, which is the following year, people start to connect the dots that ever since the sun's crying boy birding stunt, things had started to go south for the paper. The paper's owner was a company called News International that had endured protests and bursts of violence outside one of its production plants. A rival paper printed a story claiming that the sun cursed itself by burning the crying boy paintings. You following me? Okay, so the newspaper helped orchestrate. When you keep saying the sun, it's the all. Sun. It's all. There's never a sun S O N. It's always the newspaper, right? Or was there a sun involved in the story? No, it's the sun paper. It's okay, sun. gotcha. I was a little confused Sorry. for a moment. It's the sun newspaper. The the the, the paper themselves were solely responsible for orchestrating the mass burning of these paintings. Yeah, so they were they were the ringleader. Got they it. were trying to make like this huge, it, you know, it was a publicity, publicity stunt. stunt. Yeah. Exactly. But a, a fun one to to banish the curse from yes. the, the the shores of the UK. Yes. Okay. So and, they 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 kind of announced, right? Like send in your paintings, we're going to do some mass bonfires, everybody burn your painting. Mm-hmm. A bunch of people sent their paintings into the sun or dropped them off or whatever. So then they had this huge photo shoot where they burnt a bunch of them and well, they had like a model. Well, that, that, sorry, this is just like total amateur hour here. You can't get rid of cursed objects just through physical destruction. Tell me more. You need to, you know, all the rituals have to take place. Otherwise, you're simply releasing the evil back into the What are the, the rituals? I mean, it depends. I mean, do you really want me to get into the nitty gritty? Because now we got to be talking about what type of cursed object we're talking about a painting a painting okay well still you know how to get cursed what kind of curse is on it do is it affiliated with a certain type of hollowed ground you know there's a lot of factors that go into this okay if you are just blatantly destroying an object you're simply releasing the curse into the world and it's going to re-manifest possibly in a greater fashion exactly what happens in twin peaks well okay spoilers the show came out in the 90s. It's too late to be spoilers. Okay. People start to believe because the son of the company runs into some bad, there's a bunch of protests going on, like some bad publicity themselves. Mm-hmm. So rival newspapers start to say that the son cursed themselves by burning these paintings. Yeah. So you, you with me here? I'm right there with you. So people continue to try and counter curse the paintings, trying new experimental tactics, like placing a crying girl painting next to the boy. In some strange effort to offset the supernatural side effects. Counter curse. Other people tried to be kind to the painting, thinking that the sad boy just needed some love. Oh, wow. We're getting some weird people here. Mm-hmm. So now they're introducing multiple paintings. They're befriending the painting. You got to roll up the painting and smoke it. <laughs> so you may be asking, what the hell is the deal with the artist? Yeah, so it's all the same artist, right? We're going to get into it. But yes, the Crying Boys is one artist. Okay. Wait, yeah, wait, is he alive during all this? He is. What does he have to say? Because I'm sure they wanted to interview him. He's very mysterious. And that's one of the huge factors that makes this urban legend so popular. Oh, geez. Is that he's just very mysterious, right? So how, on a scale from one to mysterious, how mysterious are we talking about? Seven. Whew. To start, he has multiple pseudonyms. The paintings are signed as Giovanni Bergolin. I think it's G. Bergolin. But he is believed to be Bruno Amadillo, but also sometimes pronounced Bruno Amadillo. Amadillo. So sometimes it's spelled differently is what I'm saying. Angelo Bergolin is also another another pseudonym. And some people think he is the, the artist Francho Seville. Signed Count D. Racula. <laughs> 
While we may not know his name, we do know that he was a classically trained painter. We also know that he was painting in Venice, Italy after the war. He's also thought to have done some work restoring paintings. Okay, so now we're going to get into like the really urban legend part, like the or- the urban legend theories of the origin story. Okay, I'm going to say all of these are are un, un- like unreferenced urban legend theories, right? Okay, so all of these are from the FBI archives. That's right. Yes, the X Files. So some believe that he painted a child who had burned down his own house, and that the child was said to be named Don Benio. Another version of that, some believe that the the boy who inspired the crying boy was adopted against his will by a priest, was abused by the painter, and was consumed by a fire in the 1970s. There's a third version, that he had painted children from an orphanage in Spain, and the orphanage had burned down later after the painter had gifted the painting to them. So that he went to the, the this orphanage, he painted the kids, he gave the orphanage the painting, and the orphanage burned down. Oh, I know, sad. Another version claims that the painter had a pact with the devil due to his inability to make money as an artist. Yet another claims that the painter verified that the child was inspired by a quote-unquote street urchin he had encountered in Madrid. A Catholic priest ID'd the boy as Don Benio, a kid who had been orphaned after his parents died in a fire. The story goes that the priest had warned the painter not to hang out with the kid because he had a reputation around town as the Diablo. Wherever he was, fire followed. And of course, the painter does really well for a while before his studio burns down and his life is ruined. So his studio did burn down. These are all like uh, legends. None of this is verified. There should be records somewhere if like he did, in fact, you know, make a written contract with the devil. <laughs> Just go to the town board. Let's go to the town board. The town board. Yeah, the town board. Some of the paintings that emerged during what I'm going to call the crying boy panic in the 80s were actually painted by Scottish artist Anna Zinkenstein. Zinkenstein. So with the rise of the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously that feeds all urban legends. There's also a book from 2000 by Tom Slemon, which is about like Liverpool local urban legends. And it includes unverified, incorrect information about like the origin of this, right? Because of that, you can now look up the crying boy in this book, which is based on nothing. What? And there's, which again is like what, you know, the point of urban legends is that they, it's like creepypasta today, right? Right. You gotta, you gotta be fair here. You, writing a book on urban legends and making sure all your sources are verified is going to make for a really short book. No. Yeah, for sure. But I'm just saying like to, to, to drive the point home that none of like the backstory, like what happened was this guy had a pseudonym, so he's impossible to track down the painter. And so people's imaginations went wild, you know, Mm -hmm. let's get into the nitty gritty of this. We have to acknowledge the role that mass media plays in folklore, especially modern folklore. In 1985, the Sun newspaper was trying to fight for the attention of readers and sell copies. It is no surprise that a tabloid newspaper would print sensational material. In fact, it's part of their business model. Investigative journalist David Clark points out that much of the backstory didn't emerge until the 2000s with Tom Slumman's book on urban legends, and that most of that information is unreferenced and not accurate. Okay. I want to hear your theory. As soon as you started saying how sometimes the whole house would burn down, mm-hmm. or not burn down, but like everything would be charred and black and the painting itself would be the only thing untouched by flame. Yep. That reminded me a lot of a shoot I did with the fire department Mm -hmm. where sometimes it it was weird. Like one object would be perfectly fine despite everything else just being completely charred. And that is fascinating. Yeah. Right. And like it draws your attention. But all that says is there is so much flame retardant built into certain things. Like our like our pajamas as kids. Remember that? Exactly. It's weird when like the the curtains are totally fine in a fully charred out room just because yeah. it's they're doused with so, so much flame retardant in the materials that they're made out of Kevlar strands or whatever. Well, Kevlar is a bad example because that would char, um, but still be completely impervious to flame. Was that literally the point of having kids pajamas be flame so that the kids wouldn't catch on fire? Or was it a yeah. byproduct of something? Because to me, that's <laughs> that's crazy. I'm going to speculate. Yeah that it was a selling point. Say 
the house is on fire, yep. right? Yeah, the last thing, boy painting, the house is on fire. The last thing that you want is your kids' pajamas to catch on fire as they're trying to flee from the house. For sure, yeah. So, you know, if you are a parent and you have a choice between flame-proof pajamas <laughs> and Joe Schmo. super flammable, yeah. all, you know, ultra-burnable pajamas, right. what are you going to choose? It's a hard, hard decision. I mean, now it's not because don't swaddle your kid in flame retardant. Just What does that do? I mean, these are very harmful chemicals. Carcinogens? They are carcinogens. You know, there's been a lot of movement to try to like, bring like all natural uh, materials that are naturally flame retardant back into the home. Yeah. Just to try to get all of the, uh, you know, petroleum based everything out. Got it. Interesting. So tell us your theory about this. I think that in the printing process, because they're all from the same, you know, factory or whatever that's just churning out these mass produced paintings, there was some layer of flame retardant put into them. Ding, 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 ding. You're fucked. A BBC radio program tested the materials of the paintings. It was found that they had been treated with a fire retardant via the varnish on the painting itself. It preserved the paintings as the wall crumbled around it. And as the wall burned, the painting often fell face first onto the ground and was protected from further damage. There you go. So here's the thing, though. You know me. I'm not going to go down without a supernatural fight. I'm not going to go down without questioning, right? So, like, yeah, we got a bunch of fire-resistant paintings. We got a bunch of creepy paintings of kids. Yep. I'm with you, right? My question is this, and I don't know. I would need to look at the statistics, but the overlap, like, the fact that that firefighter had seen, and again, take it with a grain of salt, but the firefighter had, had claimed to have seen 50 cases of fires in homes when there's only 50,000 of these printed... It, to, to me, it seems like it wasn't like one time this happened. There was a lot of people who were like, holy shit, this happened to me. Maybe it was, was were house fires just incredibly common then? I don't know. You know, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, it's it's tough to come to conclusions without all the data. Mm -hmm. You need like the full you need the full set. But let's do it anyway. OK, only 50,000 were printed. Yes. So one out of a thousand homes that had this painting had a fire well this was this one firefighter's experience though sure. so assume you know and again none of it's real but like right well one fire chief right i don't know how fire chiefs work I if think. they run their one little fire precinct mm -hmm. fires f firefighters don't have precincts i don't think um, well, one little firehouse firehouse yeah or is he like the equivalent of like the fire commissioner you know that oversees all the firehouses gordon Exactly. It, all of the firehouses in all of the UK. Well, yeah. I mean, then it would be a different story. Also, like, is he going on the calls himself? How does he know that this painting was there? Uh, or is it the type of thing where the firefighters know about this because it's like a fun urban legend at this point, And so they're actively looking for the painting. Right. And how many times does it just get embellished? It's all, they're all great questions that I don't have the answer for. I wish you did. My question is this. Regardless of the mysterious origin of the painter, this wasn't that long ago. And this was produced. It was mass produced by a company. And it was sold in department stores. So the fact that there's no paper trail that people can like figure out where it originated a little bit better to me is is kind of shocking. Like This wasn't like 100 years ago. This was in the 80s. It was mass produced. I feel like we could get to the bottom of it if we really tried. Well, the one thing I want to say about that is I did a documentary years ago on an artist that sold his work almost exclusively in malls and that sort of stuff. Okay. You know, it's like the kiosk at the mall. Yeah. So either like the little place that sells the calendars, the, right. the framing shop, the Furbies, the, the Furbies. Remember the Furbies? I know what a Furby is. They used to have the kiosk of Furbies. Sure, different than the painting kiosk. Sure. But anyways, these are for the type of people that w would like to have art but don't know the first thing about it and are only going to buy art if they happen to see it on their way to the checkout. Right. You know? But again, that's where the money is. And nothing wrong with that. So he did the majority of his work in businesses like that. Okay. And... 
trying to track this own guy's portfolio was nearly impossible. Because he kind of sold his rights away? No, because every few years he would change his name. Why? It's an artist thing <laughs> where every he, he would release all of these paintings under one name. He would release this other set of paintings other this under this other name mm -hmm. like um, for each series he sort of changed sort of in you know he was an eccentric guy and it was you know a reinventing yourself process whatever but also it was a marketing thing where you can you appear to have all these different works from all these different artists in this one little kiosk and it's all one guy got it that's interesting so all, all that is to say is the world of that is very convoluted it's like that, do you know that documentary, in quotes documentary, Exit Through the Gift Shop, the Banksy film? Yeah. It's all about like questioning, like what is art and, you know, if you mass produce something, is it less, you know, it, it's very relevant to this. Well, I'm actually glad you brought this movie up. Oh. Because it is hypothesized that the original Crying Boy was made by Banksy. I'm honestly surprised that we talked, we had a whole episode about haunted portraits and we never talked about the picture of Dorian Gray. Yeah, and actually in the research, there's a lot of other cursed paintings, like actual ones that I found, mm -hmm. that people have like similar account, you know, different, not burning things, but that there's like these cult followings of urban legends around. I think we could certainly do, there's a lot more to tap here, you know, as there usually is. I mean, off the top of your head, so picture Dorian Gray, that thing from Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. What else you got? This other one. This other one. It's like the painting of a boy with a doll. Okay. But they look very, it's like kind of an uncanny valley situation, mm -hmm. but there's lots of like urban legend around it. Cool. Yeah. And and there's, you know, it's also like if you look at Slenderman, Slenderman started as a photo, as a photoshopped photo for a photo contest online. And if you think about that, it's very in line with the urban legend of a painting, right? It's an urban legend of an image. And yeah, and that people add their own gravitas to it. Look at the world in, in the all of the things that have come out of, you know, for good or bad of S that. Slenderman Incorporated. Yeah, seriously, you know. So they're like urban legends themselves are just so fascinating. And it's so fun to some degree to get wrapped up in the belief of them. But it's also really interesting to like unpack why things became the way that they did, because it's usually a reflection of culture, or society of the time, you know. I'm 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 right there with you. I think they have kind of fallen to the wayside a bit as things get wrapped up in more like internet myth. You know, it's not really tied to ah uh, this one little spooky town. It's any small town can become that town now. Oh, for sure. You Mine know? did when I was young. Yeah, like and how many people had the story about their friend that the brother knew that took LSD and then stood on the corner because they thought that they were a glass of orange juice. Well, I've never heard that one before. That happened to your brother's friend? No, that's the point. It's, you know, this was originally uh, told to me as like, yeah, my brother's friend did oh, this. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, they take LSD and then they stand on the corner for like 12 hours because they think that they're a glass of orange juice. And if they move, they'll spill. <laughs> and it's like, wow, that's intense. And then years later, you find that story on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think because when we were kind of at that age, we had this, we were like the first internet generation, right? So we had this weird overlap between being in both worlds a little, you know, where like we, me and my friends would run through the woods and we found this like red house. It was just a red house. We would go after school almost every day and just look at it. And we're like, it's haunted. Like, can you see the meat hooks hanging? Like, oh my, we would go and just stare at this house for hours and be create in our minds this backstory. We believed it. But then we would also go home on AIM on a like- a AOL Instant Messenger for you kids. Yeah. And like, you know, look up old legends and things and, and all of that played into played into it in a different way and so i i think yeah it's interesting because we were kind of the overlap and not to say kids nowadays like don't have you know real life urban legends and things like that but i yeah, wonder, their lives are perfect <laughs> no but i just wonder like how much of is it is like inspired by like creepypastas or reddit posts versus how much of it is they're in their neighborhoods and they run into the yeah. old creepy man down the street right how much is goss is like I irl and how much is from cyberspace? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, too, when you think about localization, like you said. Now, like, my haunted barn story could be uploaded and everybody could be seeing a haunted barn in their town. That's obviously a really broad example, but it could be anywhere. Well, I'm glad you brought up that the barn was red. Uh Uh-huh. Do you remember? (laughs) I remember. Why barns are red? Yeah, because of the rust. You told me several days ago. Are you just... That the barns would get rusty. (laughs) (laughs) They would turn red. (laughs) And then now they just paint that. They paint them red because that is the American tradition. That's right. The barns got rusty. <laughs> All right, guys, that's our episode. Oh, what, what did I get wrong? So you were you were so close. A component of iron oxide actually acts as a sealant. So people used to just paint their barns with a compound based off rust because that would preserve the wood. And it was way, way cheaper than paint or other kinds of sealant especially when you're just making everything yourselves. Yeah. So that's why to this day, barns are still painted red, not because they need to be traditionally sealed, but just because that was the traditional color that they always used to be. As I said. As exactly as you said. (laughs) Thank you for clarifying. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Hope you had fun with this one. We're coming back next week with a, a much bigger, bigger and exciting topic. So we're really excited to jump into that. Yeah, this one was small and stupid. No, no, not to say it was small or stupid, just that we're, you know, we've been working on this big project that we get to, we get to reveal next week. So anyway, stay safe, stay spooky, be well, be safe. We love you all. Bye. If you want to support the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast, consider joining our Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get access to bonus episodes, access to Lunatics Magazine, and all kinds of other fun perks. You can also support the show by picking up some of our really cool, fun new merch featuring gorgeous designs by Pilar Keperta. That's available on Teespring, and you can follow the link in the show notes to find that. And one of the most important things you can do to help small podcasts like us grow is to rate and review on Apple or anywhere else you listen to Lunatics Radio Hour. Every review really does go such a long way. And of course, you can follow us at The Lunatics Project on Instagram. Thank you.